my name is Tom O'Connell, and I'm going to um, say a little, a uh, few words about myself, a little bit about the um, situation in the United States, and then pose some questions for all of us to talk about here. This is my second thinkery with the Community Development Journal. Years ago, as a faculty member, took a sabbatical to Cork and met Rosie Mead and Orla O'Donovan, who have been very active with the journal. And out of that relationship over time, um, I was approached to undertake a project, which was a special issue of the journal. So that's sort of uh, been a serendipitous uh, experience with the Community Development Journal. My own background, um, I'm from Minnesota, which is uh, one of the northernmost states in the United States, the border from Canada, with Canada. Grew up in uh, St. Paul, Minneapolis, which we call the Twin City area. It's now a metropolitan area, about two million, two and a half million people. Um, <clears throat> I'm a child of the 60s, social movements of the 60s. And so a lot of my political orientation, a lot of my social orientation came out of that time in the United States. The one part was, all, was about the anti-war movement in Vietnam. And of course, there was a tremendous freedom struggle led by African Americans in the United States. And um, we had an interesting discussion last night at the table over um, really how we remember movements. What was that movement about? Were, were the participants in the 60s and 70s in the United States um, essentially uh, hippies who had a momentary uh, fit of rebellion and then moved on to their proper role as uh, on Wall Street and other places? Um, <clears throat> and or um, was there a core of people who were energized uh, and politicized during those experiences who went on to do other things, um, still keeping some sort of social uh, movement, social justice commitment. And uh, we had a little debate back and forth and um, I don't have a precise sort of um, percentage, but I do think that one of the things that happens with social movements is that people participate at all different levels and then life goes on. But there's always a kind of um, residual of people who have been radicalized, energized, and form a, the, you know, the next generation of campaigners and social justice people. And that's my take on the 50s, what was it, uh, 60s, but what is critical in that is that's not the take of most people in the United States. Um, because media has framed um, this idea that this was all fun and games and the Rolling Stones. And, and, and see these people were never serious in the first place, and um, they're just like the rest of us. So kind of cynicism about it. So I had that experience. Um, then I actually did work on both the fields of community organizing as we understood that in the United States and community development. And um, I know there's an ongoing discussion here, which I think is a really good one, and I'm not gonna get into about what is community development and what is community organizing and how do they relate. So in the, in the American context, basically, community development, the work I did there, was about essentially a fairly narrow understanding about housing and economic development in uh, communities that had been either never had any funds or suffered from um, disinvestment. And it was a pragmatic effort to harness the power of capitalism and invest at least some of that money in particularly poor rural and inner city urban communities. And the idea was to then build affordable housing, create economic opportunities, uh, merging somehow, miraculously, representation and voices from the community with people who actually had capital and knew what to do with it. Community organizing was much more about uh, bringing people together in communities, developing skills, and I know this is happening here in the UK, um, to confront institutions and change power that way. So there's almost a division of labor. And I know community development here has a much broader focus, which I think is very interesting and positive. I don't want to talk too much about that, but just by way of my own uh, in introducing myself. I spent about 15 years in various community organizations, including uh, organizations that have been developed out of the tradition of Saul Alinsky, so I'm glad that we heard a little bit about that. And then after about 15 years uh, and um, broke, um, I managed to get an academic job um, at a new urban university called Metropolitan State University. And we were, um, we're not so much now, uh, a radical in the sense that we really um, asked, in, uh, what is expertise, where does it come from? 
and um, how can we s develop um, both support uh, people in the community in terms of developing their knowledge, but also how can we raise up folks with practical backgrounds, quote unquote, and experiential backgrounds to become teachers. And that was much of the ethos, and I, I'm speaking a little bit in past tense because institutions also grow and change. Uh, so I really have uh, one foot in both movements. I wanted to talk just briefly about some big picture issues. And actually, I was kind of drafted um, yesterday to stand in. So I, I did have some notes for a later meeting we're going to have with, with the uh, board. <coughs> because I think what's happening in the United States, and from what I read in parts of Europe as well, and certainly in the UK, are some broad uh, developments that are, um, that are really uh, important and raise some issues. First, first of it is climate justice and the, re the reality that um, it's happening. And I don't know how much climate denial there actually is in Europe. It would be a fun thing to talk about and in the UK. But in the United States, we have a president who denies it even exists. And supported by large numbers of people who aren't interested in, in engaging on the question of what the science says. And that's uh, infuriating. Of course, you all probably know, or many of you know, we withdrew from the Paris Accords based on that. But climate justice has become um, a main organizing focus uh, in the United States, with a lot of uh, groups in urban areas in particular, some rural areas, who are organizing. I use the term climate justice to be encompassing not only of what used to be traditionally the division of labor with environmentalists, with environmental preservation, or not only about climate change, but connecting issues of the environment to economic opportunity, uh, to remembering that environmental racism is a huge factor, that uh, to try to broaden out who participates in the movement, um, and all of that goes into um, this idea of climate justice. Generational change, I mentioned, is important, and a lot of this is driven by people uh, we call the millennial generation, people 30 and younger, in alliance with other people throughout society. The second thing, which I don't think we much talked about either in community organizing directly or community development was the whole idea of democracy. And now all of a sudden people like myself and millions of people in the United States are getting out books about the European uh, growth of fascism um, between World War I and II. We're reading about Mussolini and Hitler. Um, and we're asking ourselves, is democracy itself, to what extent is democracy itself being undermined by a kind of authoritarianism. Um, and is this just the kind of temperamental outburst of, uh, of folks who were left out and the incredibly, not only embarrassing, but debilitating uh, and dangerous presidency? Or is it something diff uh, different and deeper? And if it's something different and deeper, um, how do we confront that in our organizing and in our campaigning, in our education? <coughs> Uh, and toward what end. So questions about democracy, which were usually left to interesting debates and journals in the United States, taken for granted, are now front and center. Uh, and we wonder uh, what it would take to preserve the very imperfect one that we have. And then the third one is a notion, we talked about this last night as well at the table, the idea that culture trumps, in quotes, economics. That people's sense of identity um, actually is a big part of what's driving the divisions in the United States. That it's not only people feeling dispossessed by global economics, by the decline of um, the industrial economies in the United States, and I know that happens in the UK, and feeling left out. But the reality that um, the demographic and cultural changes in the United States made many, many people uneasy working class people, middle class people, and we also discuss why are we always using the word in the United States, middle class, to define anybody who has a job from $10 an hour to billionaires. Why don't we start talking about working class and working people again? And I wonder how much that's a debate that you have here in the UK. Maybe the middle class is a United States uh, phenomenon. So that issue of identity is, is really critical. People, oftentimes white people, middle class, working class white people, feeling threatened. Feeling threatened about immigration on our southern border. Uh, 
feeling threatened about the, um, the um, uh, resurgence of black uh, power and militancy in the United States, feeling pissed off and threatened by people like me who have college degrees and live in sophisticated, quote unquote, urban environments and like to drink our wine in our expensive coffees and drive small cars, hybrids rather than big cars and pickup trucks and don't much like carrying guns, which is a, a, another issue. So if in fact identity is at least coupled, and I think it has to be coupled with economics, uh, but has a life of its own, um, what does that mean for the kind of campaigns and organizing and projects that we undertake here? How do you address, have conversations about people's identity and people's need to feel that they are valued, uh, that they have status uh, in their societies? And uh, after Trump got elected, many of my friends from a very urban and urbane environment uh, working on the kind of issues that we're all talking about here, promised and pledged themselves to figuring out ways to essentially have conversations with people, um, even in their own families, who all of a sudden had become deeply uh, divided. And I must say, although there's some interesting conversational projects, that project has only just begun. Um, I've been an educator for all my life and sometimes I don't know how to have a conversation with somebody um, who is coming from this deeply identity place, as, 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 as am I. And um, that's not been part of the community development curriculum uh, or the community organizing curriculum directly, but I think needs to be developed in our practice. So now some questions um, to think about. This is a thinkery, so we ought to be thinking and talking about them. Um, <clears throat> And uh, let me see where I wrote these down. Here we go. So first of all, uh, what do we mean by democracy? And have the institutions of representative parliamentary uh, democracy, um, are they adequate for the times that we live in? Uh, <clears throat> and um, is that a, a dialogue we ought to be having? Um, with each other in the community development journal, uh, in our communities, and what does that really mean? What, um, how do we talk to each other? Which is really how do we listen to each other? And is conversation uh, a very soft term that seems to have no particular goal or impact actually at the center of what we need to be doing uh, in order to create the space or uh, protect the space in which we can do community organizing and development? And what about global perspectives? I know that uh, many people uh, in many articles in the journal um, have to do with community development uh, in terms of NGOs and global development. Um, but we're having this discussion in the United States as we argue about building a wall, which is a really perfect symbol not only for protecting a border, but a wall between us uh, in the mainland um, what does that have to do with Central American countries uh, from whom many folks are coming to the United States in search for a better life? Um, and how does this imperial country, this nation, which is responsible partly or significantly for the inequality and immiseration of Central America, lesser extent Mexico, uh, respond to a project that might actually create a better life for folks, so folks would not be forced with making a very hazardous, dangerous uh, journey to the United States. And I know in Europe, I don't know so much in terms of the UK, um, that issue relates to places in North Africa and the Middle East and Syria and all sorts of places. In other words, the post-imperial, and maybe it isn't post-imperial, but maybe it's a neo-imperial world, has created incredible gaps, not only within developed countries, quote unquote, but between developed countries. And so much of our policies in the United States, picking up from the empire here in, in the UK, um, has been about um, extraction, extraction, colonialism, neocolonialism, and created many of these conditions, again, in part, uh, that we see today. So community development and community organizing, often thought of in terms of a very local place, is bound up in some way in, a, in global connections, mostly bad, some, some good, and how do we factor that, if not into our work, at least into our thinking and our conversation. 
And then there's a question about, in the United States, the S word, um, socialism, which in the United States politically has been a no-go. Um, and all of a sudden it's surfacing, largely, um, ironically, in a kind of cr crazy relationship between um, a guy named Ernie, uh, Bernie Sanders, who was pushing, I think, 75, and his most uh, fervent admirers who are 30 and under. Suddenly, for younger people coming up into a, an economy that does not look good for them, and now separated from several decades of the Cold War and the end of uh, Stalinism, uh, the S word is not um, no longer demonized and people are actually using it. Um, and we can talk about whether that's advisable or not for, as a political strategy, where it is a cultural and political phenomenon that's happening. So whether we call it the S word something else, to what extent do we look at larger structures, uh, structures of economic power and inequality, in which, are, that, which really condition the framework that we operate in? How do you have those conversations? One of the interesting things to me is a development, and I'm so glad that you mentioned Saul Alinsky, is a, a, is a, while keeping a focus on very concrete issues, minimum wage, uh, criminal justice uh, system, um, affordable housing and gentrification, those kinds of bread and butter issues that form the core of organizing, there has also been a real push for something called narrative. I don't know if this is, I don't know if that's part of the training guys are doing here. It's the idea of worldview and narrative that how can you possibly support in the United States um, actual universal health care or health care um, as a right or Obamacare or whatever you want to call it if many, many of your own people believe that health care is not uh, a, a shared um, social product. It is something you and I as our fa and families are responsible for. Um, the details do not matter if in fact that basic view of our relationship with each other, which is a, a framing and a worldview, aren't, aren't addressed. So na narrative is sort of uh, learning the art of combining p people's own experiences, their narratives, with a larger view and framing of the world as it is and the world as it ought to be. It's intellectual work and actually has its roots in some pretty sophisticated intellectual work. But it is intellectual work that has become a community <coughs> practice. Now Saul Alinsky, who so much was ideologically averse, uh, and it really did want to focus on immediate practical gains that could enlist working people uh, and winnable struggles uh, that would keep working people involved, uh, is probably rolling in his grave as many of the organizations that were inspired by him and are offshoots of Alinskyism are now engaged in uh, narrative, in worldview, and framing work. So whether it's the S word or whether it's worldview, to what, to what is A, the necessity, and B, our ability to actually ask and have conversations about these deeper questions about economics and uh, distribution of wealth, uh, and how does that relate to our work? And I think that's a valuable thing. And I think breaking down the barriers between, on the one hand, sectarian radicalism, uh, and the other sort of uh, esoteric discussions in the academy and figuring out ways to have these kinds of discussions are really critical, as well as the bread and butter specific things that we do in, in the fields of community organizing and development. Thanks.